The second round was worse. I mean, this guy just got pummeled to death. Came back and sat down. Trainer said, man, doing great. He hadn't touched you yet. Third round, he goes out as bad as the first two rounds. The third round was even worse. He barely made it back. The bell, Satan, he sat down, and the trainer said, man, you are doing wonderful. That guy's not even laying a glove on you. And the guy said, listen, somebody better watch that referee because somebody out there is beating me to death. Now, you and I know this. There are days that you feel no moss. No moss. I, I, don't know who's, I don't know who's hitting me, but somebody's beating me to death. And it would just be better if I took the towel and I just said, that's it. And when you throw the towel in, the referee will wave off. That's it. Fight's over. The winner's declared, and you go home the loser. Now, I'm going to tell you tonight that after uh, doing this, a particular thing for 27 years and being uh, serving the Lord for uh, almost 30 something years now there, there are seasons when I feel invincible that I could literally charge hell uh, and fight right on the doorstep of hell and come out victorious and then there are days that I feel no moss no moss too much now Paul is going to talk to us about the marks of effective ministry. And I've set that tone because I want you to understand there is a cause, there is a cost, but the cause is worth the cost. Number one, write this down. He said in verse number one, uh, you yourselves, brethren, know our entrance into you, uh, in unto you, that it was not in vain. Now mark this, ministry is profitable. Ministry is profitable. There are two things I need you to understand. Number one, he said, our ministry in un unto you, it was not in vain. Anytime you serve God, it is profitable. You may not see results immediately. You may not see the results you want to see. But ministry, when you do it for the right reason, uh, for the right reason, when you do it the right way, always remember it's worth it all. It's not in vain. There are days that you think, man, I've labored in vain. I've witnessed in vain. I've worked in vain. I've preached in vain. I've served in vain. Dear friend, if you serve for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his glory and his good, your labor is not in vain. Ministry is profitable. The word of God never returns void. It accomplishes that which is sent out to do. When you speak the word, preach the word, teach the word, live the word, it is worthwhile. <clears throat> Remind yourself of that. We don't keep score down here. We work down here. Score is kept up there. It's profitable. But I want you to see <clears throat> that is a true statement and that is a right statement I do not believe that's the context of this verse. I, I believe that's true. Ministry is profitable. But if you look at verse 1, connect it to verse 2 and following, Paul is defending his ministry. And I do not believe that he is saying our ministry has been profitable to you. I believe he's saying this. Look at it. Our ministry and unto you it was not in vain. And then you tie verse 2 and following verses. You're going to understand that what he's saying here is that I, the Apostle Paul, was not serving as a vain person. I didn't come looking to get from you. I didn't come looking to take advantage of you. I didn't come looking to take from you for me. He goes on, and we're going to study this the next few weeks together. He goes on to explain, because all of these accusations of his ministry are being hurled against him. Paul is saying, wait a minute, my ministry unto you, that was not in vain. It wasn't about me. Do you want to know something? I'm going to share a little secret with you that will help you. Our ministry is not about me, Miss Valerie. Watch this. 
Our ministry, Sherry, good to see you tonight, by the way, I miss you. Our ministry is not about me and Miss Mary. Watch this. Our ministry is not about you. Daddy said years ago, what do you love about ministry? I said, man, I love working with people. Seeing God deliver people, seeing God do wonderfully. I love it. They said, what do you hate about ministry? I said, said, Daddy, I hate people. Disappointment. Those that walk away. Those that kiss you with the Judas kiss. This ministry is not about me, my wife, our family, our name. It's not about you who we minister to. Ministry is for an audience of one. Ministry is not about results, but about obedience. And what Paul is saying is, ministry is profitable. It's not a waste of time, anything I've done, but I'm not here about me. I didn't come saying, look at me. I, I, I remember a few years ago, it became a big deal. Probably still is. I just don't pay attention to it. You'd go to a great re- revival meeting or something, and uh, uh, across the back of the platform would be like uh, Joe Smith Evangelistic Ministries or such and such. It would be a big picture of the preacher. And I remember thinking, that doesn't sit right with me. I don't like it when, when the preacher or even the meeting is the most important thing. It ought to be that God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working, that is what we're all about. Whenever you see a me ministry, mark that as a vain ministry. If you minister for you, what you get, your recognition, your name, your pat on the back, your attaboy, that is a vain ministry. Uh, we're not here so that you can say, oh, we love you. We're here so that we can say, we love Jesus. Don't get caught up in meism. It's all about me. Years and years ago, when we lived in Texas, we had a lady named Galita Simmons. Famous, famous photographer, very, very well recognized. <clears throat> Valerie at that time was working for Continental Airlines. And so Valerie and Galita made a deal that we would barter photography for airline tickets. <clears throat> and that was back when you could do that. It pre-9-11. There was a lot, of, a lot of freedom back then. And so we had a lot of family portraits made. And <clears throat> at one time, Galita came to Valerie and I said, we want to enter our studio wants to enter Grant and Madeline in a competition would you give permission for us to take their picture and enter them in a child (coughs) photography competition we said absolutely be great so they're doing the photo shoot and we have these at our house somewhere Grant was cute back then Madeline was beautiful and uh, there's some little dots and dogs right dots and dogs and uh Grant and Madeline were holding hands. That's when they liked each other. They were friends to each other. And they were little, tiny, cute. And uh, they actually both won the competition. It was really cool. But in that photo shoot, Galita looked at Madeline, and she said, come on, you know, express and do all the things the photographer says. And she said, Madeline, remember now, it's all about you. And she did this over her head. It's all about you. You're the center of the universe. Now, she never needed to tell Madeline that. Uh, We've been trying to break that for the last 19 years or so. But uh, we keep teasing her over these years. Madeline, it's not all about you. And I'm so concerned sometimes that our ministry becomes more about us. More about us than him. A year or so ago, I got off Twitter. I just couldn't take Twitter any longer because I felt like there was so much me ministry that it was grieving my spirit. Self-promotion, self-aggrandizing, 
you know, you sing a good song and you expect to be clapped and awarded like you've just done some tremendous thing. Uh, you preach a message, you reach a bus route, you teach a class, uh, you clean up, you do whatever you do. Dear friend, we all serve not for an audience of each other, but an audience of one. And Paul said, you're accusing me of having this vain ministry. My ministry to you was not in vanity. It's not about me. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm that one beggar who's found bread, who's telling other beggars where to go get bread. It's not about me. It's the giver of bread. So the, the profitability of ministry is not that ministry is profitable. It's that ministry is about him. That's profitable. Number two, ministry is profitable. But then he said this, but there's always conjunction, junction. What's your function, right? Profitable ministry, but even after we had suffered before. Even after we, were, we had suffered before and shamefully entreated, ministry is painful. Go back to Philippians and uh, I mean, excuse me, go back to Philippi, and uh, they were there beaten and uh, thrown into jail. And, of course, the revival broke out, and God did great things. They preached. Lydia was saved. God began to work, and those people rose up and stirred the people up, and they were put in jail. Those same people hurried to Thessalonica. Those same troublemakers got to Thessalonica and said, hey, these guys, they're doing all this wrong. And if you'll go through it, again, I don't want to preach this. We're going to come to this. But in chapter 2, uh, he talked about his imprisonment. His imprisonment, chapter 2, verse 2. And then in chapter 2, verse 3, uh, they're going to accuse him of being delusional because he's preaching error. In chapter 2 verse 3, that his ministry was based on impure motives or uncleanness. In chapter 2 verse 3, that he was deceitful, deceiving others. Uh, in chapter 2 verse 5 and down in chapter 2 verse 9, that he was a mercenary, not a minister. He was out to get gain materially. And then in chapter 2 verse 7, they claimed he was a dictator, an overlord. Man, none of that was true. That's all a lie. You say, man, I can't believe that people would lie. Why not? They, they have a father who is the father of lies. One of his greatest tools is lies, slander, deceit, guile, half-truth, untruth. You say, preacher, I can't believe what so-and-so said about me. Why not? Why are you immune to criticism? Why are you immune to confrontation? You say, preacher, I'm trying to do right and live right. It seems the more I try to do right, the more I'm misunderstood. Uh, you're not misunderstood. You're under attack. What better way to discourage someone who is trying to do right and to take the very right they're trying to do and use that against them? Paul's heart cry was to help these people know God and to follow God and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And yet they lied and slandered and accused and took everything good he did and tried to turn it bad. Paul, you're going to have to deal with some adversaries. Christian, you're going to have to deal with some adversaries and mark this down. Here's the great truth of life. Those people out there, they don't hurt you near as bad as those people in here. It is the people closest to you that hurts you the deepest. Painful. Ministry is painful. The cause is worth the cost, but there is a cost. I can't, but I, I, I won't go into any detail tonight. It's not important. Years ago, I got a letter, a blistering letter. I've gotten letters before. I don't get too many letters, by the way. I'm, I've been blessed and blessed. But I got a blistering letter. It wasn't written to me. It was written about me and got sent to me accidentally. Accused me of everything in the world. I mean, just goodness gracious. And, and, and if, you, if you knew who wrote the letter, you would be devastated. 
because it was somebody that should have been the greatest cheerleader. Instead, I mean, absolutely excoriating me, calling me a, I don't remember all the term, but, but I was a, a, a lording over the flock. But it, they didn't use that word. They used another word. And I, I can't remember. It's been so long ago. Now, I, the Lord's given me good grace and time out on my story. I'll tell, the sto- I'll tell this and I'll tell the story. The Lord's given me great grace to go forward. I don't remember details. I'm having to work to remember the details. If you're going to have long-term memory, you must have a, a long-term ministry. You must have a short-term memory. If you're going to have a long-term ministry, you've got to have short-term memory. can't live with this stuff. I don't live with this. I'm just using an example. And I mean, I showed this to my wife, and man, whew, by the way, women, they want to protect their husbands. Praise the Lord. It was awful. I'm going to tell you something. That hurt me deeply. But that didn't stop me. And by the way, that wasn't the first And it probably won't be the last time somebody that should have been supporting us was attacking us. Somebody that should have been cheering us on was actually trying to tear us down. There's nothing harder than when you try to win your loved one to Christ or help your loved one. And they begin to call you uh, names, uh, Bible banger or Billy Bible or Susie Sunday School, whatever it is, derogatory, accusatory terms where you're trying to help them and they're trying to turn it into you're some kind of religious nut. Ministry is painful. But I want you to watch this, verse, verse number two. Stay with me. So, profitable painful you know we were treated at Philippi shamefully suffered yet we were bold in our God to speak unto you number three ministry is powerful now watch this long term ministry short term ministry Philippi they shamed us they attacked us. They imprisoned us. That's okay. We get to Thessalonica, and what do we do? We talked about the people at Philippi. We complained about the accommodations at the jail. We criticized the church. We talked about those shameful. No, they, they didn't do any of that. They left Philippi. They got to Thessalonica and said, hey, we will talk to you about the gospel of God. It is the power of God unto salvation. The Christian that can move past the pain and proclaim the good news of Christ, that is a useful Christian. Boy, I I don't want to preach this and be very careful to preach it. Do not get entangled with those who are entangled in the past. If all they want to talk to you is about their wounds and their hurts and their battle scars. You ever been around somebody that, 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 that you show, hey, I got a scar. Oh, wait, let me show you my scar. And they say, you know, you're trying to prove who's got the deepest scars and the biggest hurts. Pretty soon, pants are starting to come off. You better get nervous right there, all right? They're going to show you everything. No! You get entangled with somebody that's entangled. All they want to do is live 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Listen, get away from those people. They're trying to hold you back. Go forward. There's somebody over here that needs to hear about Jesus. you got a whole world of fundamentalism that are fighting battles that have been dead and gone for 20 years. Listen, leave that in the past. Forget that thing. That's what Paul said. Forgetting those things which are behind the good things, the bad things. ago he said Brent don't treat the new people like you want to treat the old people I said what do you mean the old people hurt me so I'm going to project to the new people what I'd like to do to the old people what would you like to do to the old people you don't want to know but it's bad now that's the flesh right if we live in the past We'll project the past to the present. And we'll stay stuck. We'll stay entangled. We'll stay trapped in the hurts and the pains. Paul said, no, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to look for the next person to help. What if they fail? Who cares? What if they hurt you? Who cares? 
What if they go on and do something great for God? What if they go on and turn the world upside down? Don't live in the pain of the past. Proclaim the truth of the gospel in the present. That's what you're going to find gives you victory over the pain of the past. Is to see people saved in the present. Not your past hurt, but your present ministry for Christ. That's where your joy is. Not living in the pain of the past, but living in the present ministry of the gospel. Some of the greatest Christians I knew as a child have turned in to some of the bitterest adults I've ever seen. In their 20s, 30s, 40s, they were on fire for the Lord. But something happened and they lived 10 20, 30 years in bitterness of soul. And I'll tell you what changed. They stopped looking for the next one and started living with the pain of the last one. Preacher, how do you deal with people? Do you understand? Listen, do you understand that if we counted up all the people that have attended, joined, served, been involved with community just over my last 14 years, much less the history of Bible or the history of Central all combined. If we had everybody that started with us, continue with us, we could not build a building big enough to hold them. Doesn't that discourage you? Yes, I'm human. It hurts, no question, but I can't live with those who leave. What I've got to do is look for those who are next. Who's the next person to see saved? Who's the next person to follow Christ in believer's baptism? Who's the next person to grow in grace? Who's the next person to surrender their life to full-time Christian ministry? I can't live in the failure of yesterday. I must live in the power of the gospel today. Number four, ministry is purposeful. We are bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God. I'm going to say this, and this is for young people mostly. Young people mostly. People on social media who are trying to transition you, change you, who are trying to reform you, who who are trying uh, (coughs) to um, recover you. If you spend all your time on the negatives of life, you'll become a negative person. Paul had one, remember what Paul said, I didn't baptize none of you, maybe you, maybe you, I didn't baptize, I had one job, preach Christ. I'm amazed at pastors. I'm amazed. Preacher, do you know what so-and-so's doing in the state of such-and-such? Dear friend, I don't know what I'm doing in Pinellas Park, Florida. Dear friend, I don't know what's going on in my own church. Why do I care what's going on up the road or across the country? Listen, I don't have time to investigate you or look at what you're doing or what your family's doing or what you're not doing. I've got one job, and that's to stay on course. That's to stay on purpose. Keep the main thing the main thing. Listen, we just got to go forward, preach the gospel of Christ. You say, what about all the stuff I learned a long time ago, dear friend? I can't fix the stuff, but I can preach Christ. Oh, so-and-so, God bless you. Oh, such-and-such, oh, man, go for it. You like everything they do? No, but I don't go to their church. I can be their friend. I can be their pal, but I ain't got to correct. I ain't got to comment. Rule number three on social media, you do not have to comment on everything you read. Best thing some of you could do, just shut up. Just leave it alone. It ain't your bit, it's not your circus, not your clowns, not your rodeo, not your cowboys. Hey, it's got nothing to do with you. Leave it alone. 
Community Bible Baptist Church and this area, that's our Jerusalem. The gospel is our purpose. Stay focused on our purpose. Brother Brent, I'm concerned about your ministry. Dear brother, dear brother, my ministry is the same as it was in 1997 when I became the pastor of Valverde Baptist Church. We haven't shifted one iota, one centimeter, one bit. We're the same as we've always been. I appreciate your concern, but you don't got to worry about me. I've got one job. It's not to please you. It's to please God. Stay focused. The next kid, not the kids that leave, the kids that are in front of you. Years ago, we'd have revival. It still happens. By the way, it still happens. We'd have revival, and five out of six deacons would say, Preacher, we're not going to be in town for revival meeting. We're going to be out of town. That still happens to this day. Five out of six Sunday school teachers, Preacher, we can't come. And I used to go to a revival meeting, and we'd have 200 people there, and there'd be 50 that should have been there that weren't. And boy, I'd bring in a good preacher. By the way, we got revival in June this year. We're not going to host the conference in June. We're going to host the conference in January. But we're going to have a summer revival this year. There's an old-fashioned, Holy Ghost, Bible-thumping, Bible-preaching revival. And uh, we'd, have, we'd have 200 people there that night, 50 people that aren't there that should have been there. And I'd just sit over there. I mean, the singing, we'd bring in a special singing group. We'd bring in a great preacher. And I'd just be sitting over like this. And I'm just mad about everybody that doesn't show up. I mean, just, oh, I'm going to kick their arm up. And after about two or three years of that, the Holy Spirit said, hey, dummy. That's his pet nickname for me. How about thanking God for the 200 in front of you instead of being mad about the 50 that don't show up? That changed my whole demeanor. By the way, I think that changed the atmosphere of our meetings. I stopped worrying about who wasn't there, and I started thanking God for who was there. And I said, hey, those that are not here are not going to get the blessing. Those that are here are going to get something from God. Let's have a good time and learn and enjoy the present, not the past. Let's stay right here on purpose that we have a job to do, and the people with us right now are the people we're serving with. What about those that quit you? They're not here. My daddy said, Curtis said to my daddy, out of sight, out of mind. I love you, but you left. God bless you. You going to go get them? No. You going to chase them? Uh Uh-uh. We're right here, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Monday through Saturday. We're right here. You know where we are. If you want to come find us, we're not hard to find. We're not going to dwell on those not here. We're going to not dwell on what was done to me. We're going to stay living on purpose. The gospel's sake. That baptistry to be stirred. Discipleship to be had. Ministry to be conducted. Paul said, I am going to stay on task to be bold, to preach unto you the gospel with much contention. That word is a word that doesn't necessarily mean to fight contention that word is the word that means opposition and it's really used in the matter of athletics the Grecians of course they're famous for their games and so the idea means here a place of contest strife conflict a combat effort victory The owing to the opposition, there was a need for effort on my part. In desperate struggles of those who contended for the mastery at the Grecian games, the triumph of the gospel was secured only by an effort of the highest kind by overcoming the most formidable opposition. Number five, write this down. Ministry is persistent. Persistent. The idea here is, is Greco-Roman wrestling, Grecian wrestling. The idea here is a contest. And he said this, he said, I know that the enemy 
is getting stronger, therefore I must keep working. I must get stronger. I must get better. Our girls and our guys finished their basketball season a few weeks ago. And immediately after the games were over, I told my girls, all right, season next year starts this week. You say, well, the season doesn't start for another 12 months. Oh, no, no, we start this week. We've been defeated for the last three years by the same team in the state championship. We beat the other teams. We do well against everybody else, but we got one team that every year we, we go against them, and, and this for my girls, and my girls just get rolled. We just get rolled. They're just a good basketball team. And I said, girls, here's the difference. I said, we play basketball, they're basketball players. We play basketball, they're ba they play all year. Our girls play in the season. As soon as volleyball is over, they start playing basketball. After basketball, they don't think about basketball until next year at the end of volleyball. And I said, girls, if we're going to go down to Fort Pierce and we're going to compete against this other team that beats us every year, we've got to stop waiting until the week that we play them. We've got to start working tonight to get better and better and better and stronger and smarter so that when we go down there, we can give them a better game and hopefully beat them. I'm an athlete. I wasn't a great athlete, but I do understand athletics. And I understand this. If you want to win on the court in front of all the fans, you've got to work a lot of hours when nobody's present. When you want, I played football in high school and college. If you want to do well on Saturday or Friday night, man, Monday through Friday, the off-season conditioning, weight training, all the things you hate, that's where champions are made. And what Paul is saying is this, if I'm going to get better and get better, I've got to stay consistent. He said, I have got to keep working. He said, I have got to pay the price. Much contention. Mark this down. This is not an easy calling. Some of you men that are considering the ministry as a calling, some of you ladies that are considering the ministry as a calling, it is not an easy calling. But living the Christian life is not an easy calling. But maybe it may I suggest this, not living the Christian life is not an easy calling either. The difference is which one are you going to choose? Choose your heart. Which heart? To live the Christian life or not? Both cost something. But if we're going to live the Christian life, we've got to be persistent. We've got to be consistent. Keep working out. Keep lifting. Keep training. Keep being faithful. Say, preacher, how's it work? I don't know. I just know this. When you come Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, when you read your Bible, when you pray, when you go soul winning, when you give, when you serve, when you deny self, when you do right. I don't know how it works. I just know that it works. I'm going to say this, and I'm done. Brother Tim, make your way to the platform. Brother Monroe, whoever's coming. I'm going to say this. The cause is worth it. So discouraged in so many areas. The devil's attacking in so many ways. You must continue. You must, if for not your sake, your husband's sake, your wife's sake, your children's sake, your grandchildren's sake. This country needs you. This community needs us to be consistent. Desperately needs us to be consistent. Now is not the time to quit. Now is the time to continue. Persistence. Why? Do you think for one moment the devil's like, well, I'm, I'm done. The devil is looking for new and better ways to destroy you and everything you love. Therefore, you have got to not be weary in well-doing. You've got to keep on keeping on. Do right. Oh, Bob, Dr. Bob used to say, do right till the stars fall and still do right. Doesn't matter what others do. Doesn't matter what's done to you. Do right. You do right. You do right because it's right to do right. Marks of ministry. Not easy. I used to think, I used to think that surrender was enough. 
I'm just going to give it all to the Lord. I learned something. It is not a surrender. It is daily surrender. You, you've been doing this 20, 27 years, preacher. Guess what? i got to die again in the morning. I've got to surrender again in the morning. And the next day, and the ne- I've just got to keep at it. The devil never stops. The devil never quits. Doesn't take days off. Doesn't take vacation days or holidays. He's pressing and pressing. I've got to get stronger. So, well, if you get to a certain age, it gets easier. No. Get to a certain age, they change the rules on you. New, new levels, new devils, new battles. Some of you would love to go back and fight some 20-year-old battles or 30-year-old battles. These 60-year-old battles or 70-year-old battles or 80-year-old battles, they're a lot different. You know what to do there. This is new territory. Hey, you got to keep getting stronger. Got to keep getting stronger. Marks of ministry. And I want to be right. I want you to be I want us to be right. Father, tonight, help us to learn from this apostle, this, this Paul who teaches us there's going to be trouble. There's going to be difficulty. There's going to be battles. But it's so worth the effort. There's nothing vain about it. Not in what we do and if we do it right, not in how we do it. Teach us tonight to be faithful to our calling because our cause is worth it. We pray, we ask. Let's stand together. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to have Brother Tim just play through. If you need to use the altar, the altar is open. If you need to make decisions, the altar is open. If you need to pray, the altar is open. You come, join these that are coming. Brother Tim, you sing, you play. You step out of your place, you pray, you pray. You come, you step out. In a world full of broken dreams Where the truth is hard to find that is kept there are many left behind though it seems that nobody cares it still matters what you do cause there's a difference you can make but the choice is up to you to his call will you stand when those around you fall will you be the one to take his light into a darkened world tell me will you Father, bless us now as we head out and start the week. Help us to look forward to that next person, that next opportunity. Tell someone about who you are and what you've done for us. Lord, I pray you'd help us to get over the past and live not in the future, but live right now in the present. Lord, do our best to stay on point, on purpose, to help others find their way ask you now, believe this. Give us a great, profitable week of ministry, we pray. Bless the outreaches. 
bless the discipleships, the schools, the training, all that's said and done. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to have uh, Brother Mills come and give us our memory verse.